Okay, let me tell you a little bit about our guest, guest with us today, Ed Norris. He's a, he's a New Yorker, Yankee fan. Won't hold that against him, though. Met fan. <laughs> <laughs> Met fan. From Brooklyn, started his career with the NYPD back in 1980. And he got promoted and promoted all the way through the ranks. Ended up as deputy chief and deputy commissioner of operations of the NYPD. And during that time, he created, I thought it was really interesting, he created the Cold Case Squad. And that, that inspired a book. And I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but I used to watch the Cold Case Files on TV, A&A. &E. That's that's, he inspired that. And it's really said that Ed is a, is a cop's cop. He knew how to handle himself. And more importantly, he knew how to handle the street. And in 2000, the year 2000, he was recruited by the mayor of Baltimore, come down here to Baltimore and be our uh, police commissioner. And he really did a hell of a job. He improved the culture, the motivation, morale of the, of the police force. First time in more than a decade, the homicide rate was below 300. And now it's probably close to 300 right now. A couple years later, he was recruited by the governor this time, Maryland governor, to be the Maryland State Police Superintendent. And as a result of his work, he reduced crime and really made it better for all the citizens of Maryland. He was also widely known for his role as Detective Ed Norris on the HBO critically acclaimed show, The Wire. How many people have seen The Wire? Great, great show. And he also played an investigator in the 2009 movie, the film, Jack the Ripper in America. So he's a TV and a movie star and a radio personality. And speaking of the radio, he's currently you know, doing the 105.7, the fan. How many people listen to that show in the morning? I mean, there's a lot of people. It's a great, great show. And of course, he's the author of his book that we're going to talk about today, entitled Way Down in the Hole. He's been down there at the bottom, and he's certainly been up there in the top. He also does a weekly show for Fox 45. And I got to tell you, Ed, I didn't tell you at lunch, but uh, I was a guest on your show about a year and a half ago when uh, my book came out uh, on resilience, entitled Stronger. And Steve Davis invited me to come down and, uh, with Erica Braddock, the lady that lost her leg in the, uh, in the Boston Marathon, because mm -hmm. uh, I interviewed her for the book. But you weren't there that day. And right. I was really looking forward to meeting you. I remember. So now it's a great honor to be able to meet you right here. So for our audience, I guess, let's kick it off. You know, talk a little bit about, you know, you're a cop's cop. And I, I've heard that from a couple different people. Talk about life on the street as a cop. You know, many people in this room, and certainly myself, don't understand what it's like to be a police officer in a big city like Baltimore, much less New York. Yeah, well, I guess I'll start with New York. It was this, you know, I got hired. I was, a, I was at the University of Rochester, and I played football up there, and I thought I was going to become a doctor. It was my dream. I was a physics major, believe it or not. Wow. And by my third year, actually, my second year, I went to pay the bill, and I had to, they don't give, uh, it's not Division I, so you have, like, little scholarships that cover the, by the you know, time I was a sophomore, I went to go uh, meet with the dean. He's like, yeah, you're a varsity athlete, a fraternity member, dean's list student. You're such an asset to the campus. You really should look at the state university. Uh, they kind of kicked me out for money. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't pay the bill. So I had no, I was not in college. I was up for double sessions, so I was already at college. And it was August, and I, I had to leave. So I left, I came back. My father told me, when I was in high school, take the police test. So I did, and uh, thank God I did, because September 2nd, I just turned 20 years old that April. I was old enough to become a police officer. I, I joined the NYPD, so it, did, it was not the path I intended, but I took it. And while I was not thrilled in the beginning, because it's not what I really wanted to do, um, I loved that job. It was, uh, doesn't pay you know, like other professions, but you get a, a ringside seat to the greatest show on earth every day, so. Uh, <laughs> And the things, that, and these are in the books. I, I, I try to stick to stories that are in the book because they're interesting and they're some of the cleaner versions of things I can tell. So there's things that people just don't know. And I, you know, I, I, all this stuff you hear about, you know, cops out there in America being crazy and they're out of control. And it, people, this is such a false narrative. You know, it's funny, like, especially, I, I came out in 1980. And just one of the, I'll tell a couple of quick stories of what life is like as a cop in a big city. So where is the biggest city? I remember just walking down the street. I was walking down 42nd Street when it was 42nd Street. And uh, I see, I'm in plain clothes with my partner, and I see this very big guy punch this little 
15-year-old girl in the face was giving out chicken flies for Popeyes. Apparently, he said something filthy to her. She cursed him out. He lays her out in the street. Wow. So I turn my head. I look at him, my partner. I, he turns and goes, you want to be a hero, Captain America? So I'm wearing a USA Olympic jacket. So like, yes, I do. <laughs> we go crashing through the doors of Popeye's chicken. And, you know, like sugarcoat things. I hope you're not offended by, you know, rough language. But we beat the shit out of him. He was fighting back. He was trying to get away. He's trying to hurt me. I punched him till my arms got tired. And he locked him up for assault on her. Turns out he robbed the Popeyes the week before. The manager came out and said, oh my God, that's the guy that robbed us. So I had him for robbery and assault. But the, the secret, the, the point of the story was, never touched him once the handcuffs were on. Fight was over. Bring him down, process him. I don't, you know, he's gone. He goes to whatever time he serves. Sometime later, I'm on 42nd Street again. This time I'm in uniform. I've been to court and I came back to put me in uniform to just patrol the block. A woman's having a seizure. So I kneel down to make believe I'm giving aid till the paramedics get there. So I you know, just try to comfort somebody till the, the real people know what they're doing get there. And uh, all of a sudden, as Times Square was bad then, I started to hear the cries from the crowd, get his gun, get his gun. You know, they, it was common. They would jump us all the time when it was you know, bad in Times Square. And then I hear this lone voice from the back of the crowd, nah, nah, he's all right. It was Lorenzo, the guy I just had the fight with at Popeye's like the year prior. The point is, he knew he did wrong. He knew he wasn't treated unfairly. Nobody beat his brains in when the handcuffs were on. We had our fight, he hurt me, I hurt him, all over, fair fight. People in the street get it. And this is such a terrible narrative that's being told in this country. I just you know, want to tell you, that's just one of the stories. And then, just sort of the transformation of being a, a young officer, man or woman, you come into a police department, you know, we all, we concentrate on how people change in the military and things like that. You change in the police department, too. I remember when I went to the academy, I was barely 20 years old. And one of the things they make you do is go to the morgue. So you're not freaked out by dead bodies when you see them in the street and people in pieces and things like that. Yes. So we, they make you watch autopsies. You, they're pulling the bodies out of the drawers and, you know, you see all these uh, people just died the night before. And then you go in the autopsy room and there's like eight tables and they're sawing everybody in half and it's just gruesome. So I start to get very woozy. I'm like, whoa, this is... So I, up, I leave and I'm like, wow, this is, this is rough. If you fast forward from the day in the academy when I was a, a recruit to my days in Times Square, when you're new, one of the things you get assigned is to get all the crappy assignments. So when you're a brand new cop, very often you guard dead bodies till the, the morgue gets there to take them to the mortuary. So that was my assignment one more. I go to the Carter Hotel, relieve the midnight crew. I go to guard the body now. The crime scene's been dusted. There's a man laying in a, you know, on a bed in a room that I swear is not much wider than these tables. It's a little you know, SRO hotel. And he's stark naked, laid out across the bed, and he's got a bullet wound between his eyes. His brains are coming out. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so he's lying on the, on the bed like that, and I'm like, oh, this sucks. I got to stand up now for seven hours till they get here. So I'm reading a book, leaning against the wall. And the book was Jim Morrison's biography, No One Here Gets Out Alive, which I always thought was funny. So I'm reading my book, and I'm getting tired. This is ridiculous. I'm standing up, and I'm, he's right here. And I, I'm like two feet from me to the bed. So I decide I'm not standing anymore. He's not going anywhere. The crime scene's been dusted. I crawl in bed with him. <laughs> Did you hold his hand? <laughs> I just got next to him and I just lay there and I hung out for a couple hours till they picked him up. I finished my book and I thought to myself, wow, dude, have you changed? <laughs> yeah. Everything changes, obviously. But, you know, after your great career at NYPD, you came down here to Baltimore. Tell us a little bit of what was different. What was the good? What was the bad? What was the ugly? What's good is I came here for a reason. I mean, you know, I got charmed in to come here, really. There were other cities that had, uh, I was looking at. I had done my 20 years in New York. I'd run the operations for the biggest department in the country. So it was my time to get the top job somewhere, I thought. And uh, Seattle was open, Denver was open, LA was coming open. I got wow. a call from Baltimore. And it was on the Saturday after Thanksgiving, I get a call and said, my name is Martin O'Malley. I just won the mayor's race in Baltimore. I'd like to talk to you about becoming police commissioner. I'm like, who the is this? <laughs> like, come on. I thought it was one of my friends just playing a joke on me. It was really the mayor, so I took the train down. It's like the mafia, you have to ask permission to leave. So I went and asked my, the police commissioner how it's safer. 
and Rudy Giuliani, if I could take the opportunity, and they told me, you deserve it, you deserve a shot, but be careful down there, it's really dangerous. I was like, danger. I've done the most dangerous work we have here. I've hunted <laughs> fugitives my whole life. He said, we don't mean that kind of dangerous. It's very politically dangerous there. I said, All right. These guys who knew. But I took the job anyway. And I came here because the need was the greatest. I just, I've never seen such a broken city. You know, New York is New York. It's got its problems. Every big city does. I've never, ever seen anything like in Baltimore. Ever. My friends would come down, and these guys... My friends, a lot of them grew up in like Brownsville and Bedford-Stuyvesant in New York, some of the toughest neighbors we had. They became New York City cops. When I drove them around, they came down to ride around with me. Like, dude, where did you move? They were like, they couldn't believe how, how we live in this you know, city, how dangerous it is, how, you know, how crushing the poverty is. Um, so that's the ugly. And the good is the city is a great city, and I still live here because I get treated like a king, for one. Uh, people really appreciate the, the work I did, I think. And I think it's a great city that deserves to be saved. It's just unfortunate that after all that hard work, the last couple of years we slipped the other way, and now homicides have been well over 300 for the last two years, and we're going to surpass that, I think, this year. So that's the bad news. Um, and there are some differences, though. You know, it's not as, there's a lot of, the politics here is just unbelievable. It's just the connections and the, <laughs> I'll just give you a quick story. Like, I went, I, I Someone mentioned Vice Squad, but um, a friend of mine ran the Vice Squad. We had a, a tip that there was a, a, a floating whorehouse in Baltimore. It was a board They would go to different bars and bring prostitutes, and people would pay, and there'd be liquor and women and all that. But they would move to a different bar every week, so people would, you know, in, it was underground, so people would find it. We're not going to tell you where it is. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually we found it. So luckily, we got intel. We find it. We hit it. We lock up everybody. One of the people we lock up, is a lieutenant in the Baltimore Police Department. He's the protection. He was running the muscle for the club. By the way, he's on duty. Out of his district. Yeah. Out of his district, on duty, running the muscle. He was the hired gun for this ring. I fired him. Shocker. So I fired him. He was connected with a lot of local politicians. I get called to the city council for a hearing about this. Now I'm about, this is my second or third year, so I'm pretty much up to here with the politics here. I go to the hearing, and I listen, and the first thing they want to know, why did you fire Lieutenant Mack? We'd like to know, you know, is, what, you would think you were harsh on him. What would you reconsider? I'm like, I spun it. I said, you know what, I will. Matter of fact, I'm going to bring him back. I can do that. So I looked around the room. I said, just tell me who wants him in their district. Do you want him? Do you want him? How about you? I went around to every council person on that panel. All of a sudden, they get really interested in their papers. They were all looking down and shuffling <laughs> papers and like shifting in their seat. I picked up my hat, put it on, and left. That was, that's the kind of place this is where you wonder why things don't get better, because it's OK to have a lieutenant running the protection for a whorehouse as long as you're a friend of his. It's like, this is just, and that's got to be fixed here. That, that's the one problem about having such a small to more kind of place. So. Even with all the political intrigue, Ed, you were still considered as one of Baltimore's best police commissioners, really, of all time. Men and women in blue, we here still love you. How did you motivate them? What did you do? How did you create the organizational change to make that change in your time? A couple of things. That's, that's an important question. A couple of things. Um, I, again, when I got here, I also thought, wow, this place is not equipped to fight crime. Um, I was shocked at things that had been abandoned. Like, um, you know, most, even at that time, like if you were the victim of a robbery, you'd go to a police station and you'd go to a computer terminal and look, you'd say, the, right, the guy's a, you know, a male, white, six foot, brown, whatever description. You know, you punch in the descriptors and people of similar, you know, description will pop up on the screen six at a time. And you'd look and say, no, no, no. They were still showing photos out of shoeboxes here. It's like, you don't have computerized photographs? No. No wiretaps. Biggest drug problem in the country. Not up on any phones anywhere. No surveillance equipment. Can't track cell phones. The helicopter unit had been abandoned. You had no aviation unit in the, I think the sixth biggest police department in America. Um, no helicopters, which are very important in a place like this. Um, they had a terrible crash. It was a 
equipment error, the operator died, the, cop, the officer died, so instead of like trying to bring the program back, it was just abandoned. Um, so I started to undo all these things. And little things I found, like cultural things are important to the, I'm sure important in whatever business you are. But in the police world, a lot of people come in because they're legacies. Their grandfather was an officer, their father was a cop. So culture is important, and when you change culture, it really doesn't sit well with people, especially if you're from the outside. So I was from the outside, so I wanted to make sure I brought the culture back. They had a very unique nightstick here. And while this may seem like the most minor point to anyone who's not a, post a cop, they have a stick that was unique to Baltimore. It's very ornate. The cops, and they twirl their sticks. If you grew up here, you see the officer twirling on post. And that had been discontinued. So people came up and they said, would you bring it back? It's called the s Pantoon. I said, it's in the dictionary, unique to us. I said, I'll tell you what, if you can prove it's in the dictionary, I will bring it back today. 20 minutes later, the cop comes back, <laughs> Merriam-Webster Dictionary, s Pantoon, in Baltimore, policeman's nightstick. Like, you got it, brought it back. You would think I gave him a gold brick. It means a lot. Little things like that mean a lot to people, you know, because they had their same stick their father carried, their grandfather carried, you know, that's what they grew up, maybe they're on 20, 30 years, they, and it was taken away from them. Little things, and I also found you have to lead from the front. Um, I would never ask them to do something I wouldn't do. So every day I go out on patrol, I mean every day. You see me, and guys to this day come up to me, I book signings, cops come up and say, you don't remember me, but you backed me up on North and Pensy. You don't remember me, but I was on a car stop in the Western. You, you came up and pulled up at 2 in the morning. I was shocked. That was important. Because you never can be, I don't want to be perceived as some guy in a suit in headquarters who wouldn't come out and like do whatever they would do. So I did it. And I, got, I actually got the idea from Hewlett Packard. I can't remember if it was Hewlett or Packard, but <laughs> <laughs> one of those two men, he would have a contest every year. And he would, they would have a contest with the best employee of the company, and they would disassemble a computer or handheld, whatever the device it was. And it was a race that he would disassemble and assemble it faster, and he always won. So I said, and I said, it's a great idea. I would never want to be, so that's why I jump fences, I'd run, and I would never call the press when I did it, because I knew the communication would get out there. I remember my first day on patrol, I was in uniform in East Baltimore. I pull up in the car, and I have a driver, and I'm in uniform, and the car's marked, and I see guys selling heroin right over there. So they're doing a heroin deal right here. I'm staring at them. And I'm just waiting for them, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm waiting for them to run, because there's 50 more heroin deals to the next five blocks, so. I'm just waiting for these guys to run. They don't run. Now I'm pissed. I'm like, all right. So I fling open the door. I, I mean, you, can't, you know who I am. I look like a Mexican general. I got all the stars and the gold in the hat. And like, <laughs> I chase and I get the slowest drug dealer in America. So I, I get him, I throw him on the floor, and he's throwing him in his mouth. So I reach in his mouth and I yank out a bunch of heroin gel caps. I'm like, What's up with you? Like, you don't even give me the respect to run? <laughs> at least in New York, they'd make believe. Like, you know, they're like a zebra at the watering hole. Like, they see the lions come, they'd run and come back. And like, that guy didn't run. So he said, well, nobody would stop. It's like, oh, man, <laughs> that's the problem. But that's the stuff I did because the, that got through the department like that. It, was, it got to the news, got to the Baltimore Sun within a day. They did a story saying, you know, I was out there. And... You know, you hear Unit 1 in pursuit. <laughs> the police commissioner chasing somebody. It was like hitting a beehive with a stick. There were cops everywhere. I mean, it's just like, you know, people just flooding the area. So that's what I did to lead the department. And, and then having their back. Like, you know, instead of throwing people under the bus, you know, what's supposed to make America great is due process, the presumption of innocence. And I, I've never seen, in a, police, people are accused here, and it's, you immediately assume they're guilty. Immediately. You know, we had an officer accused of a rape in the Southwest District. A woman said she was raped by the officer, six of them, something like that. And people throwing them under the bus. I, mean, I, went, I was out of the job then. It's like, wait and see what happens here. People make stuff up. The state's attorney indicted all six. This was before this administration. One of them was in Pennsylvania when the crime allegedly took place. It wasn't even in the state. Turns out it never happened. The woman recanted. But that's the stuff I didn't do. I had a kid, you have to back up the cops. It's a unique job. There's no boss standing over you out there. They're on their own. So they can, they can just as easily be the fifth car on the scene as the first if you need help. Because if the perception is, 
I'm going to get in trouble if I do my job because they're going to throw me under the bus. Guess what happens? You get 300 homicides a year. So I had a, guy, a young officer had a, he locked the up in a warrant in his house. The guy's handcuffed. Of course, as soon as handcuffs go on, the prisoner always has to go to the bathroom. It's the ploy. They always do it. We always say, oh, sorry, you had your chance. You pee your pants, but you're not going to the bathroom now. We're going. This kid was young. He uncuffed the suspect. The guy's in the bathroom. The officer goes to look. The guy's trying to kill himself in the bathroom. He's cutting his own wrists. The officer kicks the door open. Now the guy comes at him with the knife. The officer shoots him and kills him. So now there's a big crowd outside the house. They want to know, like, you know, did he make a mistake? in Australia, what's going to be done? Did you suspend him? I was like, I'm suspending anybody. I was like, he may have made an administrative error. He may have shouldn't, maybe he shouldn't have uncuffed the guy, but there's no rule that says you can't if someone has to go to the bathroom. But we'll look at it. But if you commit me with a knife in a tight hallway, I'm going home. I have a bulletin for you. It's just the way it is. I mean, I don't know what people expect the police to do in this country. If you tried to kill them, they could have killed you. I, I don't even, I can't wrap my mind around this logic that you think is like TV, like they come at you with a knife with, you know, within three feet, you're going to disarm somebody somehow. It, it doesn't happen. It's not, not, not real life, man. It's ugly. It's, it's brutal. It's a, it's a dangerous, brutal business. But that little incident where I backed this kid up, that was a, a big moment because all of a sudden they felt like, wow, this guy has our back. You know, that was a big difference. You know, it's, it's so fascinating because you're talking from a leadership perspective and relationship to business, too. And you're really talking about modeling the way. You did what you... You wouldn't do anything that you didn't ask somebody else to do. Wouldn't you would ask. do it yourself. Yeah. Buck Showalter talked about that when he was here a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Talked about how he backed up his players. He does. And you're doing the same yeah. thing, which, you know, people will die for you. You know, mm -hmm. they, they still love you. Talk a little bit about, more about the book, if you could, Ed. You yeah. know, I mean, you've been at the highest levels... And you've been down at the lowest level, mm -hmm. too. Absolutely. Talk about Let's that. Let's start at the lowest level, because I found something very interesting here that Marty said before. Um, I, start, I decided to write the book. Kevin actually got me to write the book. When Rob wrote his book, I was interviewed for a chapter in Rob's book. I know Rob from my police days. And then Kevin was the author. And Kevin wrote the book and then approached me and said, would you, would you, want to, would you be interested? And I decided, like, 13 years prior, I did want to write one, but I couldn't. But I, I agreed to it, and Kevin and I came to a deal, and he partnered up with me, wrote the book. But the night I really decided to write the book, and it's important for everybody in this room, if you own a business, you're very vulnerable. You really are. And I'm going to tell you what happened. This is the real story. I remember the book opens, I am lying in the hole in Atlanta. Atlanta, the USP Atlanta is one of the worst prisons in America. It's where, I mean, Al Capone was there, and... The Cubans burned it when they came over, the, you know, the, when Castro released all the prisoners. It's a terrible place. And uh, I found myself in the middle of my incarceration, on the floor. I'm in a cell, locked in a cell, and there's two guys in the bunks. There's no room for me. They're smoking meth in the cell, blowing it through the vent. Yeah, you can get anything you want in prison. Anything. They're smoking meth, doing their thing. I'm lying on the floor, and I look at my feet. I have on two different color sneakers. I have orange prison pants on that are like two sizes too small, a shirt that's about six sizes too big, and I'm holding a rolled up newspaper wrapped in tape against the door of the cell to keep out the rats. Oh, it's all right. And as bad as you think it sounds, I start to laugh like a crazy man. I start thinking to myself, I say, like, how did they get away with this? I was the colonel of the state police. I was Baltimore's police commissioner. I'm in a hole in Atlanta for lying on a mortgage application. And my life was ruined. And I said, I'm telling this story someday. I'm going to tell people what really went on. Because it's nothing like what you read. It's <laughs> Let me tell you what really happened. That landed me in prison. Prison. There was that fun you read about. and I'm sure you all read about it. It was used for personal days. It was with liquor and women and gifts and blah, blah, really. If anybody bothered to read the indictment, if you added up everything purchased for every alleged girlfriend in the, in the case, it went up to $1,000 because it never happened. I'm not an idiot. I'm not saying I didn't hang out with women I shouldn't have when I was on trips. I didn't say that. I'm not going to buy anything, a gift out of a fund and put it here. 
This is $500. My lawyer would ask me, did you buy a car for somebody or something? I was like, no, of course not. People read the indictment. I was indicted for buying uniform police shirts, because if you haven't noticed, I need the tailor. <laughs> Yucky. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm built like a mailbox. I don't fit into stuff that just, if you want to look sharp, I had shirts made by a tailor that were Baltimore police shirts. I was indicted for having custom-made shirts for my personal use. I was indicted for buying combat boots the day after 9-11. Because I was on the street protecting everybody here with a machine gun. Because we didn't know what was coming. I'm in battle fatigues. I didn't have boots. I went to Dan Brothers and bought boots. I was an indictment particular. I was indicted for buying, oh, we had a blackout in my house. My wife was in the house along with my son. The security detail bought candles to light the house. She offered to pay. They're like, now we got it. Apparently it was charged in a stupid fund. I was indicted for $68 for candles. <laughs> not kidding. It goes on and on, like on and on and on and on. I can read, I'm not going to retry the case because it's done. It's done. But when they were looking to do this to me, what they did find when I bought my house in Mount Washington, I borrowed $9,000 from my father. He gave me a gift letter. He gave me nine grand just to make sure I could cover all the closing costs and all the expenses. It was tax time. Just gave me $9,000 just in case I would fall short. At some point, I paid him back by check. They found the check. That's a federal crime. Because you swore when I got this gift letter, we both signed it, that the money was mine. The day I paid him back, it was no longer a gift, it became a loan. It's a federal crime. Preposterous, sounds stupid. I knew it was not right, but everybody knew did it. I shouldn't have done it. But that's what I did. When they found that, they threatened me with this. They told my lawyers if I didn't take a guilty plea to the stuff I didn't do, they would put me in I'd never seen my son grow up. I would have said I shot Kennedy. I mean, what are you going to do? What do you do? And I say this to you because if you ever watch Billions, you know, yep. this is all of you. I mean, I don't know what business you're in. When they want you, you get somebody unethical, you're done. They will find something you've done. I don't care what it is, they will find you. And if you're a big enough target, if you're really successful, really wealthy, really popular, like I asked earlier, why are they doing this to me? He said, you're the eight-point buck in the state. You're the biggest name in the state right now. Thankfully for me, the guy who did it was stupid enough to send out emails to his other assistants saying he wanted three more front-page indictments by Election Day. They found that highly unethical. They sent it to the Department of Justice. The guy who was there, ironically, was James Comey, the FBI director. This guy can. He was a DOJ. He, he prevented this guy from doing any more public corruption cases, though. He said, no more until we approve them. You can't do this. They sent a team in. By the end of the year, he was fired. For what they called, justice called a lack of judgment, a lack of candor. <laughs> you know, that's right your own conclusion there. But he was fired. The guy behind me under indictment who was not prosecuted yet, had his charges dropped. He got $182,000 back in legal fees. Unfortunately for me, I was already in prison. I was in Atlanta when I found out. So a guy came to me and said, hey, isn't this your guy? Didn't he do? I go, yeah, that's him. Thankfully, and this is why it was important about convicted felons, I'd, just like, I'd like to just dump you know, on what he said. Like, from my experience, and I'm not, just, I'm not crying, this is not a woe is me book. This book is a book of my whole life. It's not this whole little, this little period that ended up badly for me. This isn't like cry for me and I got screwed. Not that. But it did change my perspective because I put people behind bars my whole life. And when I get in there, I realize my impression, I was in three prisons. I was in Florida and Eglin, I was in Yazoo City, Mississippi, and I was in Atlanta. Half the people in prison should never get out, ever. But the other half should not be in there in the first place. There's a lot of really decent people incarcerated for really crazy things. And when you're in there, nobody's bullshitting each other. It's not like I didn't do it. I, my cellmate told, I told, you, told my story, he goes, you may be the only really innocent guy in here. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, it's just, guys in there. But I mean, I had a kid in there who was arrested, he was smoking a joint, he was on a military base. He was, he was driving through Fort Bragg, federal crime. You don't even locked up for that here. There were so many people in there. This is a guy in there for misprison of a felon. I didn't know what that was. It's an old term, it's an old English term. Misprison of a felony. If you witnessed a felony and no one took place and don't report it, you're guilty of a crime. So he knew somebody committed some kind of act they went after. There's crazy stuff going on out there. The country is, we have more people in prison than any country on the planet. We're less than 5% of the population. How is that possible? 
How's that possible? And then people get out, and that's why this was so important about helping you know, convicted felons get back into the workforce. You have to, even if you don't want to, it makes sense for you. They're going to get money somehow, and if you don't let them come back in and work, they're going to do something. I went out and I had to get a job when I was released. I got turned down everywhere, because they ask you if you ever, yes, yes, no. One company didn't ask, I got hired. I worked in a perfumery, a cologne store, so high-end colognes, razors, da da da. Oh, I used to open the store in the morning, I had the keys, I was a trusted employee, they loved me there. Somebody recognized me, called the, co the company in you know, headquarters. I got a call from the manager, I was fired immediately. From the mall. <laughs> I, I, I'm a college educated person, I had 41,000 people under my command in New York, yeah. I got fired from the mall. You have to really open your mind a little bit and think about this. You know, so. But basically, this is why I wrote the book. And it's not just about this one piece. I just want to tell people, and the reason I tell that story, if you're in the stock business, you're in banking, you make a lot of money, you become a target, you're not getting away. And I just want you, when people get in, if they get incarcerated, they get indicted, don't assume they're all automatically did it, please. Because the, the level of, the burden of proof for an indictment is the same burden of proof a police officer has when he locks you up in the street. It's just probable cause. Doesn't mean you did anything, but that's what it is. It's a very low burden of proof. And like, I remember my first moment, I walked into prison in Florida. I don't want anybody to know who I was. So they asked me what I did on the outside. I made up some story. I said I worked for Rob. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good story. <laughs> and I got, a guy goes, hey, could you come outside a minute? I'm like, sure. I walk outside. It was Martin Grass, he was the CEO of Rite Aid. Martin's like, Everybody knows who you are. We're waiting for you to get here. <laughs> <laughs> have a welcome party? <laughs> so it didn't work out so well hiding my identity. So and I have stories there about what it's like to be a cop in prison and all. But that's my, uh, my little, my one thing I want to impart to this group as CEOs of companies. I'm telling you, it's, our system is not, it's not good. It's a very, very unfair system of justice that uh, really opened my eyes for, for, for a lot of reasons. One final question for you, then we're going to open up to the audience. You know, my book is on resilience, and which is, you know, it's a key thing being able to, you know, rise up again. You know, juxtapose yourself lying in that prison, you know, keeping yeah. the rats out. How were you able to respond? How were you able to get back on your feet? How were you able to where you are today? I mean, you know, you're very talk lucky. About I was really, really lucky. These guys never get caught and fired. My guy got fired. Mike Nifon with the Duke Lacrosse case got fired. They rarely get caught when you have an unethical prosecutor. And, I'm not, and believe me, I love, I know most, my whole life was in law enforcement. Most of them, like everybody else, really good people for the right reasons they do it. Um, I ran into a, a rogue. Nifon was a rogue. Um, when he got fired, I got a call, because Greg Kane from The Sun wrote a column saying, wait a minute, should we now look at what happened to him differently? So when I was home, I got a call from uh, CBS Radio in Baltimore. And the guy who was my boss, became my boss later said, hey, we did a poll on the radio station. Now that the, we found out what you know, kind of changed the narrative here, would you want to do radio? And initially, I'm like, no, I want nothing to do with Baltimore. I'm <laughs> done. Then I'm like, well, that was really stupid, because <laughs> you don't have a job. So, it's like, <laughs> so I called him back. I said, all right, I'll do it. So I did. I was under house arrest for six months after that. So I did it with my ankle bracelet on in my little office there with a microphone. I called in an hour a day, and then it became popular. And it also gave me a chance to tell my story. You know, for all the haters out there, I was able to fight back finally and tell my side. Like the government told theirs, and I told mine. And then things changed, and I ended up getting a radio show, and it became popular. And I'm doing it for 12 years, and I owe a debt of gratitude to David Simon, who wrote the forward, um, because he kept me employed when I was unemployed as an actor um, in all five seasons of The Wire. And I'll tell you how mean this place is. I did a scene here right by City Hall. And there's a scene, if you ever watched The Wire in season three, the guy that throws up outside the bar, that's me. So when I was filming that scene, the mayor's office got wind of it. They called David Simon and said, uh, we want him fired. He shouldn't be working in this city. We want him. I swear to God. Simon had the, he said, if I fired every actor who had problems, I would do the show with hand puppets. He's like, <laughs> he stays. So David kept me employed. So that hence the name of the book and uh, my debt to David, if you know him, I really owe him a lot. So that's how I got where I am.
Okay, great, great story. We're going to open it up to the audience. Rob. And one of the interesting things that I found out about your background, I think it might have been over a bottle of scotch or something, I can't remember. <laughs> you actually had the plans, uh, the first plans in the United States for an Al Qaeda attack during your law enforcement days in New York. Yep. Many people don't know that, and I think it's really very interesting. Maybe you can talk a little bit about it. Yeah, it's in the book. Um, it was my first day in a new assignment. I just got assigned. I was in the, I was a detective lieutenant. I was working in a rough area of Lower Manhattan, the Lower East Side, all heroin, and just got involved in you know, chasing a guy who shot at people like that night. And I get a call after we bring him in. He, this is the kind of place of what he gets. So many threw eggs at him. So he decides to retaliate by firing this nine millimeter at him. So we lock him up, and I'm in processing the prisoner. And I get a call from the chief Manhattan detective saying, "Hey, would you mind taking over the 17th detective squad?" Now I was in the seventh, which was a a dump. The 17th was the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Henry Kissinger lived there, Catherine Hepburn, Bobby Short, on and on and on. Um, so I'm thinking, yeah, this is a tough decision. I, I work in the ghetto. I can work in a place where there's great restaurants, beautiful women, and no crime. <laughs> you scratch my head over this one. So I said, of course, yes. So that Monday, I get transferred to the Upper East Side. So I go in that Monday, and I just processing my, you know, my paperwork, get my parking permit, find my office, say hello to the detectives, and I go home. I get a call from the woman I'm replacing. She's like, Eddie, uh, we had a shooting. I'm like, wow, nobody gets shot up there. I mean, the only one you know about is when John Gotti killed Paul Castellano in front of Sparks. <laughs> That's the kind of place it is. It's, you know, mob hits maybe, no street crime, very little. And I'm like, wow, that's big. She was, yeah, was in a hotel. I'm like, what? She said, yeah, a rabbi. I'm like, rabbi? She said, yeah, Meyer somebody. I'm like, Meyer Kahani? She said, oh, yeah, that's him. Mark Ahani was the head of the Jewish Defense League in America. He was a member of Israel's Knesset. He was a very fiery speaker. And uh, ironically, he was doing a book signing. He was in the Marriott Hotel on Lexington Avenue signing books. And as he's got the line at the podium for his signature, an Egyptian man walks up. He's got a yarmulke on, though. He's masquerading as a, a Sephardic Jew. And he pulls out a gun, and he kills Kahani at the podium. So he kills him. He runs out of the room, shoots another man, and tries to stop him. He runs on Lexington Avenue, and he jumps in a taxi and jumps out immediately, which is important. He sees the police officer crossing the street. He shoots him. The officer returns fire, wounds him. So they're both wounded. So now we have a prisoner for the murder. Basic police go through his pockets, find his wallet, his ID. He's got a piece of paper in there with the name of every Jewish politician in New York State, like a, like a hit list of everybody, uh, Mario you know, Schumer and all these guys that you know now. Um, so we have that. I send detectives to his house. At 1 o'clock in the morning, at a house in New Jersey, two other Egyptian men answer the door. Not surprised to see the cops. They're cab drivers. They admit to being at the scene about the time of the shooting. So we have no authority in New Jersey, so we got them to come back voluntarily. Ha. <laughs> we bring them back. We arrest them when we cross the river. And uh, <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> and then we do a search warrant. I have, two, I have the getaway drivers, the shooter, and we do a search warrant. Find these two file cabinets. In the file cabinets are these books of bomb making manuals. I can't read them all in Arabic. I can't read them. But there's pictures everywhere, so I know what it is. And then there's photographs of like police headquarters, the FBI building, the Trade Center, the Brooklyn Bridge. You get the picture. There's a black and white composition book, like when we were kids in grammar school. It looks like an armored car stick up sketched out. I'm like, this is something big. So I go through the night, and I go to brief the chief of detectives for the press conference the next day. And he questioned me directly. He said, Eddie, can you tell me this guy acted alone? I'm like, of course not. We have two other people, the getaway drivers. I have all this stuff I can't read. I don't know what I have, but I've had something very big. This is a big deal. He told me, I quote, you shut up. You, I'm a 30-year-old lieutenant, so I'm pretty much a nobody. You shut up. You handle the murder. They handle the conspiracies. He points to the feds. The FBI is in the room. They tell him. Chief, we have no reason to believe it's other than a crazed lone gunman, blah, blah, blah. I'm furious, but I can't say anything. By the time I got back up, I go to lunch, I go back to my office. The file cabinets are gone. We had turned them over. The prisons were released. They said they had not enough probable cause to lock them up, which was nonsense. And so my two murder suspects are gone. My evidence is now with the federal government, and I process my prisoner. So we go on, and I'm, a, I'm not the detective, but I'm the boss. We process him, he gets convicted, and he goes away. I get transferred to Lower Manhattan. The Trade Center gets bombed in 1993. I can hear the explosion of that work nearby. I get a phone call, we have to talk to you. 
something, really. I knew intuitively, I knew immediately what this was about. Turns out, the guys that I was forced to release in 1990 blew up the Trade Center in 93. Rent the guy, Abel Lima, the big redheaded one you've seen pictures of, rented the van, they put it under there, they were trying to take the Trade Center down in 93 and put it in the wrong place. That's why it didn't fall, but six people died and a thousand were injured. Turns out they never translated the documents we gave them. Midway through the bombing trial, the 93 bombing, they translate the documents on top of every page, Al-Qaeda, like they were doing a book report. And the whole plot was in there. Take down the buildings of which Americans are so proud. The plot for 9-11 was in there to take down the Trade Center. I had it in my possession, but nobody listened. Nobody listened. And they covered it up and covered it up and covered it up. And I only became courageous enough to talk about it in a book because this has been in other books. And I've been mentioned as the one who sounded the alarm, so I don't, I'm not fearful of talking about it now. But that's what happened. So yeah, I bet, and there's a plaque to this. And if you go to the 9-11 Museum, there's a little plaque saying that wasn't the first time in 1990 we recovered what I recovered. It doesn't mention me, but it's what we did. So it's a fact, and you, you know, just something you probably bet you never heard the story. So I uh, hope you have faith in your government now. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's funny. That's a good question. Yeah, I was terrified to go. I'm not afraid of money. I'm not afraid of much. I was terrified to go to prison as a cop. Um, I found, honestly, and I, I, look, I wasn't Angola. I, I, this wasn't the Shawshank Redemption. But it wasn't Hogan's Heroes either. You know? <laughs> so, it wasn't that much fun. Um, so I, I was okay because I found, I mean, a lot of, there were guys who, was, you know, they would say stuff. I had a confrontation with one guy verbally one day. And they would talk stuff, but I made friends, actually. And what I found is, because there were so many people there who were regular people, like, there's a lot of guys. I, I made friends with the drug dealers. I made friends with the stockbrokers. If you, I find if you, treat, you act like a jerk, they're going to burn your bed. That's what they did. <laughs> if you were really an ass, they would, you would find your bed on fire. Um, but if you acted like a decent person, you got treated like a decent person. And um, the only time I was afraid was when I went to Atlanta, because Atlanta had such a bad reputation. We got evacuated from uh, Mississippi, and we dropping prisoners off along the way in you know, Alabama, and da, da, da. We get to Georgia, and we're going to Atlanta, and I'm really anxious, because Atlanta had a terrible reputation. And it was like 22 of us left that knew who I was on the bus. So I told my friend next to me, I said, I am so afraid I'm gonna get hurt here. <laughs> he gets up on the prison bus and says, nobody gives up Eddie's profession. I bet 22 people in your business couldn't keep a secret for a minute. <laughs> I don't care what business you work in. I served the next three months of my sentence there. Apparently nobody knew. And it actually came close once. I walk into a TV room, which was the most, any of the violence that took place, somebody would get cut and it was in the TV room, over a chair, over a channel. You know, a lot of, a lot of angry people in prison, believe it or not. <laughs> so I walk into the TV room and one day and ESPN3 is on. And who's on this, the screen but me in my state police uniform, Stetson and all, because we had hosted the police Olympics that year. So I walk into the TV room and I'm like, holy shit, <laughs> I'm on television. And everybody's looking at the screen. Thankfully, I had a beard down to here at the time. And I was like, whoa, cool, fun. I walk back out, nobody recognized me. So the, fun, the last point, the punchline is, my last night, the night before you leave, and I hope, I mean, some of you will get to enjoy this someday, your last night in prison. <laughs> we hope not, Ed. <laughs> no, no. There's two kinds of Americans. Those who have been in prison, those that are going, as far as I'm concerned, because our government's out of control. But you know, last night, your friends make you a meal to say goodbye. So there was a prisoner in there. It was an old Italian guy. I mean, oh, he was almost 80 years old. He, he was brought over by Albert Anastasia. And uh, he cooked an Italian meal for me and my, like, eight, ten friends my last night. In the middle of it, the warden calls me up to the hill. They're going to put me back in the hole for my protection. Because Richard, Jane Miller and Richard Scher were outside with news trucks waiting for me for the next day. And uh, he was concerned for my safety. I'm like, I've been <laughs> you weren't concerned for my safety every other day. Tonight you're worried? You know. So he said, yeah, we're putting you up there. I don't, don't want to go. Anyway, I go back down to the camp. And the guards are coming to get me. And I, he's like, well, you got to go. I don't want to go. And I knew these guys. Like, you don't want to go up there? I go, no. I said, I, these guys know me. They're not going to hurt me. He said, all right, man, we're fans of The Wire. You could stay. So they let me stay. The funny part of the story was 
now people are confused because they know me with the guy with the big beard who they didn't, I'm not really, people, my friends knew, but the other guys didn't know what I did. And nobody talks about it. You know, it's just a bunch of angry people. We're all, we're all broken in our own ways. So nobody really wants to talk about their problem. <clears throat> but I lived with the prison thief. He was the guy that would steal from the other prisoners. It was just, it was, <laughs> I'll describe briefly, I gotta go. He was this really thin, really dark, muscular guy, out of his mind, high 24 7. He wore a do rag and three baseball caps at the same time every day. I'm not kidding, each one was a little more askew than the next. He wore like three caps and the do rag, and I lived with him. And I told him, his name was Eddie as well, I was like, Eddie, just don't steal my shit. You want anything, you can have it. Don't steal my stuff. I will give it to you. Just let me know what's missing. Because he had to pay his debts because he was always in trouble. So in prison, the commerce is whatever, you know. Cans of tuna, candy bars, you got to pay your debts. And they get paid quickly. There's, there's no, nobody welching in there, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> but finally, it got out like this. I was somebody because the cameras are waiting, and everybody's waiting. You know, finally, this guy that had known me for months, who was like the biggest thief in the prison, and forgive my language, he turns to me and says, man, who the fuck are you? <laughs> it's like, I go, well, <laughs> let me tell you. So I told him who I was, I gave him a bunch of books that I was in, and he thought it was the, most, the funniest thing he'd ever heard, that he was living with the colonel of the Maryland State Police for three months, and, <laughs> and had no idea, but uh, overall I got treated pretty well, it's just, you know, hope you never have to experience it, but uh, it, it wasn't the worst part. The worst part was the, um, I guess the scarlet letter coming out. That was, you know. Yes, sir. How do you keep a positive outcome focus as opposed to being bitter? You mean now or then? Yeah. Now? Because I was bitter for a long time. I was bitter for a long time. I wished to, you know. <laughs> I said for years that if I was if I was told I had three months to live, some people were gonna pay. And I was very bitter. I couldn't write the book for about a decade. But I found it was very unhealthy for me, for one. I couldn't function, I was always angry. Um, and then I, it just, I get, I pay. the people of Baltimore helped me a lot, like, they really did. Like, it's just, in my head, I was suffering. But people on the outside were great to me. And then I, all of a sudden, I said, I don't know why I'm so upset, like, people treat me really well here, everyone seems to get what happened. So I started to just say, I'm not gonna do this anymore. And I, I convinced, I said, I'm gonna write a book about this. They told their story, I'm going to tell mine, and I'm not going to whine, I'm going to tell a story about a great career that was cut short, and the recovery, you know, the, how you come back and you live, like, so that was my motto, and I did it, and like, I, I tell you just anecdotally, I was in the Southside Diner, you know, on Ford Avenue recently, I went to buy my, you know, pay for my eggs, man at the next table with his daughter, I, I wanted to pay his check. The owner said, well, you can't, because we picked it up already. Oh, wow. You know, this is how I'm treated around town, so... <laughs> People still thank me for my service. It's like, I, it's just, it was a total turn. And the book helped me a lot. It was really cathartic. Because telling the stories was really hard when I did it. I would break into tears. I would get angry. I was like, but then when it was over, it was over. You know? Now it's like, you could say whatever you want about me. You could like me. You could hate me. You could say whatever you want. You ask me about it, I wrote a book about it. I'll send it to you. That's all I'm doing. I'm never talking about this again, other than these things. <laughs> <laughs> And it's really a cathartic thing, like you said, being yeah. able to get it out there and maybe even the concept of forgiveness. We have a full-blooded yeah. Italian here. Yeah. Ed is half Italian. <laughs> Antonio. Full-blooded Italian. <laughs> and you have a lot of friends in the room. Yeah. New, York's, New York Yankees season ticket holder for fifth. Really? Fifth I'm a Mets fan. I'm not even impressed with okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard you say Yankees before. Okay. So you, you, you spoke very eloquently about leading by example. Mm -hmm. on the beat, right, yeah. 2 o'clock in the morning. So then we're faced with the antithesis of watching the riots, watching our police officers, yeah. bricks thrown at them, yep. Molotov cocktails, lighting their cars on fire, climbing on the top of the cars, jumping, stamping, and, and burning it. Down yep. the is, is it fixable? Do we, do we recover <laughs> from there? Is it, yeah. is it recoverable? Yes, recoverable? it's recoverable. Well, look, when I, I, it wasn't much better when I got here. It, you know, we had over 300 murders for the whole decade prior when I got here. And we got it. We led the country in crime decline every year because the police thought that you know, I, I had their backs. And because I had, their, I had the business community behind me, they had my back. 
and the, although my relationship with Martin O'Malley is not good now, but at the time, he let me do it my way. He didn't interfere too much. He did have my back politically. And I was able to do things that I don't think you could do a lot of times. But it's definitely fixable. And I, I can tell you, I, that broke my heart. If I were here, that first brick thrown would have been the last. Because just standing there watching this happen, it destroyed, I mean, it hurt the city's economy. It hurt our image. I mean, police officers got hurt. People are terrified to come here now. And, and it was all lack of will. You, you can't tell me. I watched what happened in Mandamin. Like, a SWAT team that are overrun by teenagers? Come on. Come on. That's not, that doesn't happen on any other day unless you tell them to. It's like that whole stand down thing. That, that killed us. The stand down order. Give them room to destroy. That's a fantastic idea. <laughs> Let's do that. Last question Len Miller. Why do you think that they targeted you mm -hmm. in the way they did? What, do you have a reason? Or well, a I have a suspicion. <laughs> I'll just, I, I can't accuse anybody because I don't know, so I don't do it in the book. Um, well, it's a combination. It was a perfect storm because they had a prosecutor that, because of what he wrote in that email, he saw himself as becoming this crusader who was going to lock up a lot of public figures. And he had people on his list. So I had a very bad person in that seat over on the, in the Gurmats building. So I had that. So when you had that, and then I had people perhaps left mad because they left the city. I'll just tell you what, the way it went down. When the whole fund was in question, the son, they had a I was at a press conference in the US Attorney's Office regarding a drug deal, a bus we made, um, together. And it was a co-press conference. And Gail Gibson, the son, directly asked the US Attorney, are you going to be looking into this, the, me, the fund? He said point blank to the news, no. He said, there's no public money involved, so we, we wouldn't look at it. He said, I may have, there was, no, there was no taxpayer money in this at all. This had nothing to do with the public or any, this was police cops money that was gaining interest since the Depression. No taxpayer funds, no oversight. You could use it for whatever you wanted. And uh, he said, no. He said, we, I might have spent it differently, but we're not looking at this because we don't think there's a crime here. I'm paraphrasing now. He said, no. So that was September, I think, of that year. I leave to go to state police in January. And when I left, O'Malley, you know, he wasn't happy. But I couldn't take much more of this here. And uh, it's like every other business. His minions were like taking pieces out of me. It was all the people around him. Like, you see, you know, he's getting too popular, boss. He's making you look bad. You know, you got to knock him down a peg. All that stuff was going on. He's spending too much time in the gym. He's not paying attention to work. All this little backbiting was going on. And then I go to state police. I'm at a funeral. I'm the superintendent of state police for two weeks. I'm at a funeral down in Crisfield. I get a call from Regina Avarella, my press officer. He says, I'm sorry to tell you, the feds are here. They're taking all the boxes out for the discretionary fund. I'm like, what? So I mean, I can't, I can't accuse people of speculated, but two weeks after I leave city service, a concerned citizen went to the US Attorney's Office, and the case started. You know, and then it went on and on and on. And let me tell you what they did to people. You know, this, is, this is your government at work, and I don't take too much of your time, but this was disgusting what they did. And this isn't me complain about what they did to me and my family. They would, subpoena, they would subpoena people. Like if I went up and I dated a woman years ago in New York and went to see her when I was on trips, they brought her down. They brought down business, private business, I had to close their business to come down here. They put them in front of the grand jury one after another. I get a call, I was in a car stop on 95 with the state police. I get a call from a woman who ran a, a luggage store here and I was a customer. She was not a girlfriend of mine, just a, I was a customer. But they knew I found it. I bought her a drink once in the Renaissance because she worked in the building. I was in the bar. I knew her. I bought her a cocktail. And uh, they brought her in. I pick up the phone. She goes, I don't know if this is important, but I was brought into the US Attorney's Office. I'm like, what? My knees buckle. I'm like, why? She's like, well, they asked if you ever took naked photos of me or uh, used sex toys on me. I swear to God, I'm not making this up. They brought her in. They brought in my fr a couple friends, like you know, friends with husbands and wives. Asked the women when their children were conceived. Was I the father? Yeah. This is, it's not in the book because I don't want to get too salacious, but this is what really happened. This is the United States attorney asking these questions on a financial case. How about asking her if I ever sent her on vacation? How about that? Ask about that. Ask if I bought her, you know, a car. Ask if I sent her to Bermuda. You're going to ask if I took nude photos of her? This is what they're asking the people. And what happens if you ask that enough in front of a grand jury you see every day for a year? You start to bend their mind and their thinking. It was disgusting what they did. Disgusting. And uh, I just I, I think, look, <laughs> I think the guy should be in jail. The guy who did it. He got fired. 
to me, it wasn't enough. He should have gone to prison for doing this. Because if he didn't get caught, I would have been in prison. So would a bucket load of other people in city government and state government, because he had them all lined up one under indictment. So he would have gotten away with this had he not been stupid enough to send those emails out. So now I'm getting bitter again. <laughs> <laughs> His fault. Everybody, Ed Norris, what a job. <laughs> <laughs>